Hello, and welcome to the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. I'm your host, Benjamin Douglas, and this is the show where each week I read a chapter from a different indie author. Thanks for joining me for today's reading. Hey guys, welcome back, and thanks for joining me this week for episode number six of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Uh, Today I'm going to be reading from the work of Joseph Lalo. Very exciting. And we're going to be reading from his novel Free Wrench, which is the first in series for the Free Wrench series, a steampunk fiction series. So I'm going to begin by reading Joseph's Amazon author bio. A native of Bayonne, New Jersey, the fabled birthplace of George R. R. Martin, Joseph Lalo is an unlikely entry into the world of literature. After a childhood spent daydreaming and reading, he fully intended to pursue a career in the tech sector. He received a master's degree in computer engineering from NJIT and subsequently got a job working IT for a large healthcare corporation. Things changed when, in January 2010, his friends finally convinced him to publish the story that had accumulated over the course of a decade of spare time. That story, now known as the Book of Deacon trilogy, was a surprise hit. And once he got a taste of the world of indie writing, he was hooked. Now he splits his time between writing novels and writing articles and reviews for BrainLazy.com, a group blog he helps run. His latest novels are The Decaron Apprentice and Skykeep. All right, so that's Joseph's Amazon author bio. I want to mention that if you visit his Amazon author page, you're going to find quite a few novels, and a a few of them are free. I think they're perma-free, including the one we're reading from today, Free Wrench, but also The Book of Deacon, which is the first in the Book of Deacon series. I don't know if you guys have seen this cover. It's I just have to talk about it for a second because I love it, and he's probably tired of hearing about it because I think everyone tells him this, but it's iconic. There's just there's something about this image of this girl, this woman in the story, standing there and holding a staff, and there's something about her face, along with just the composition of the image in general, that's really arresting. Uh, so a big shout out to the artist, who is, I believe, pronounced Nick Deligaris, or Deligaris, I'm not sure which, but he just did a phenomenal job with that, and he did all the covers for the Book of Deacon series. They're eye candy, absolutely eye candy, so go check those out. The uh, Book of Deacon series is a fantasy series. What we're reading from today, Free Wrench, that is a steampunk series. Looks like Joseph also has uh, some science fiction going on. Uh, He has a superhero novel, which I I sort of grin when I say because it's a little bit of a running joke on the the podcast that he hosts uh, about this novel. I I haven't actually read it. I think the joke is that he just hasn't seen the marketing success that he wants with it, and he feels like maybe he's missed the superhero boat a little bit. But um, check that out if you're into superhero books. Um, And here's an interesting thing. It looks like just a couple of days ago, on April 18th, he released Rogue Derelict, which is a Kindle Worlds novel set in the Fallen Empire world, um, which is the world uh, by Lindsay Baroker of her um, late sci-fi series. So, uh, yeah, new release there by Joseph Lalo in the Fallen Empire world. Might want to check that out. Speaking of Lindsay Baroker and Joseph's podcast, I first discovered Joseph Lalo, refreshingly not on keyboards, but rather from the podcast that he co-hosts along with Lindsay and with Jeffrey Poole. And I'll be reading from Jeffrey, by the way, in I think three weeks. That is the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast. If you haven't listened to this podcast yet, 
man, do yourself a favor and check it out. It is absolutely one of my favorites. This is a heartfelt recommendation. I listen to it every week without fail. And I find value not just because I'm interested in writing science fiction and fantasy, but just as an aspiring author in general, there's all kinds of interesting information, a lot of anecdotal evidence and interesting stories from authors and people in the biz about marketing specifically, but about a gamut of other things too. They have really good guests um, and they ask really good questions. They do the podcast as a live event on YouTube and if you are available on Tuesday evenings when they when they do the live show, uh, you can hop onto the YouTube live chat. You can ask questions. They'll answer them in real time. It's just a cool thing all around. So check that out. And um, I will leave a link to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast in the show notes, along with, as always, a link to Joseph's author page and his Amazon author page. I have no qualms about plugging that podcast during Joseph's time because I consider myself evidence of the fact that it's doing him good. I might have never heard of him if it weren't for that podcast, honestly. And just a second of brutal honesty, I only went to that podcast because I found it through Lindsay Broker's platform, her website and blog in the first place. But now I've discovered Joseph Lalo and I'm reading Free Wrench and I'm reading the Book of Deacon, and I'm finding a lot of enjoyment in his writing that I would have never been exposed to, and he wouldn't have had me as a reader if he weren't co-hosting that podcast. So, you know, there's an idea out there that a lot of platform building can be a waste of time for an author, especially if it's uh, highly specialized toward other authors because there's this idea that other authors don't read your work. They're busy writing or reading what they like to read. And on the face of it, I'll buy that to some degree. It sounds like it makes a lot of sense, certainly. I know some of the most prolific authors that have been on the podcast lately talking about their reading habits and how those have changed since they began writing all the time. Yeah, that's true for them, maybe. Michael Anderley talks about how he used to be a self-described whale reader, reading X number of books a year, and now he reads like a very small handful because that time is now filled writing. But not everyone is Michael Anderley. Uh, and I think, you know, not to be self-deprecating, but I do think that there's a market of people like myself who haven't actually published yet or haven't published a lot yet but are interested in consuming media made by people who are self-publishing or have self-published a lot and i think that people like myself are interested in reading the fiction of these people as well this is just speaking from personal experience i haven't like crunched any numbers but i'm just telling you i want to be a writer and part of it is because i'm a total fanboy I read these books. Uh, I, I really like them. I have I got a Kindle for Christmas three years ago. Um, before that, it was only ever hardbacks and paperbacks, and I just read the same books over and over again. I was a, you know, you read um, The Silmarillion at least once every two years, and The Lost Tales after that, because you got to get all the backstory. And you read all the D'Artagnan romances once every couple years. And then in between, I would read my guilty pleasure, more, less literary, more genre fix stuff. Some of the Tor fantasy books, you know. Um, now that I have my Kindle, man, I have just been devouring indie author after indie author. And I'm a real fan of some of these people. And this is speaking as someone who reads and who wants to write and who has been working on their writing habit. So... Um, kudos to you, Joseph, for getting fans through your platform and for taking some time to give us some value because I find a lot of value in that podcast. So hats off to you, man. All right. Lastly, I just want to remind everyone that the reading you're about to hear does not come from any official audiobook. This is just my own reading done for this podcast. If you'd like to hear actual audiobook readings of Joseph Lalo novels, please do visit his webpage or his Amazon author page, both of which you'll find links to in the show notes. All right, without any further ado, on to today's reading. 
Free Wrench by Joseph R. Lalo Chapter 1 Each shift ended with a short but very necessary shower to restore herself to something resembling a human being. That was the most inconvenient part of being part of the female staff. There was but one shower to be had, and modesty forbade sharing it with the men. So when the time came for her to wash up, she had to wait until it was unoccupied, and post a sign one of the other workers had made for her, stating that the showers were reserved for Nita until she was through. It was one of the reasons she'd switched to the less popular night shift. Regardless of the weight, though, she always hit the shower. Stewing under a layer of marinated leather while she was in the tunnels was all well and good, but it was not a pleasant way to spend one's leisure hours. Now her shift was behind her, her sweat rinsed away, and her dark calderan skin no longer stained darker by grime and soot. Having changed into her simple white dress, she was ready to go home. "'Good work today, Nita,' said the foreman, a man named Stover. "'See you tonight?' "'Wouldn't miss it,' she said, hanging up her gear in her locker." I'm going to take a few of the coil boxes, all right? Stover gestured vaguely. He was coming off his own shift, and his brain had punched out at the very same moment he had. She likely could have asked if she could borrow his liver and received the same response. Just inside the walls of the hub, at the curb of a cobbled street behind a wrought iron fence, was a clockwork contraption called a winder. Like so many things in the hub, it was an accumulation of turning gears and spinning rods, with a grid of metal cubby holes aligned along the front. Each cubby had a lever at its side, and in the back of the empty ones could be seen a hexagonal socket slowly rotating. Most of the cubbies were small, holding palm-sized boxes, but those nearest to the ground were much larger. She pulled the lever on a pair of the largest occupied cubbies, sliding out a bracket and dispensing two boxes, each three inches thick and a foot square, with a matching hexagonal shaft on the front and a handle and switch on top. Nita! She turned to see one of her fellow night shift workers, Drew, rushing over to her. He was in his usual after work outfit a collared shirt, rough black pants, and beat up brown shoes. And he carried a large bag of salt on one shoulder and a canvas messenger bag over the other. Since the steamworks generated its energy by piping seawater into boilers warmed by the volcano's heat, an inevitable byproduct was a copious amount of brine, which eventually was allowed to dry in the sun to produce sea salt. Workers were free to take as much as they liked, with the remainder being sold. You're looking excited, Drew. Why shouldn't I be, he said, stepping close to add in a conspiratorial whisper. The airship is coming in tomorrow. I thought I'd swing down and see what they've got to offer. Did I show you what they sold me last time? I don't think so. He glanced around in a way that did more to make it obvious he was hiding something than it did to keep it hidden then pulled a leather portfolio from the messenger bag. Nita took it and flipped it open. A parcel of thick pieces of paper lay inside, each bearing a grainy black and white image. They weren't drawings, or at least not any sort of drawing she had ever seen. 
As she flipped through them, she came to notice a theme in what the images depicted. They were all pictures of women, each one wearing lacy clothing, and often very little of it. Drew, really? Nita said with a disapproving smirk. You shouldn't be buying anything from those black marketers from the mainland, and certainly not something as crass as this. It isn't crass. Oh no, she asked, plucking out an image of a woman wearing a corset that had nothing to do with supporting her back and everything to do with the more common task of accentuating certain other assets for display. He snatched the image away and tucked it back into the portfolio, which he then dropped into his bag again. I was admiring the fashion. My sister is a seamstress, after all. I thought she might find some inspiration. Besides, have you ever seen such things? They call them photographs. Apparently, you needn't be an artist to create them. They use something called a, a camera. He said the unfamiliar words syllable by syllable as though they were in some alien language. A push of a button and a puff of smoke, and you've got one of these. If it is that easy, I might finally find something of mine hanging in a gallery. I'd need only find the proper things to point the camera at. I'm hoping they will have one for sale. I imagine there are any number of models who would jump at the chance to be among the first to stand in front of my camera. And no doubt you would ask them to display this wonderful new fashion while they did so? Who knows? One must go where one's muse leads. He winked at her, then turned to leave. See you later, Nita. She waved and carried the coil boxes over to a spindly vehicle near the gate. It looked like a horse-drawn carriage. If someone had been challenged to design one using as little material as possible, and the first thing on the chopping block had been the horse itself. The frame and chassis were little more than thick wire. The wheels were hoops half her height, with thin spokes and narrow treads. She opened a container between the rear wheels and slotted one of the coil boxes inside. Once she had flipped the switch on top, she climbed into the seat and twiddled the levers a bit. Gears clicked and spun, and the vehicle rolled quietly into the street, powered by the unwinding spring inside the coil box. Amanita still lived on the Grouse family estate on the far side of the town nearest to the steamworks. Since the hub was considered something of an eyesore by the locals, even the closest towns were a fair distance away, but she didn't mind. It gave her a chance every day to take in the scenery of the breathtaking Telan countryside. The islands were fortunate enough to enjoy temperate weather through most of the year, and the local flora was lush and tropical. This came at the price of a vicious storm season each year, but that was well behind them for now, and she was free to enjoy the morning breeze and fresh air. For one who had never visited Caldera, the splendor of even the lesser cities was a sight to behold. Dell Harbor was anything but small, and shone as one of the brightest jewels in Telan's crown. Even Amanita, who had spent her life there, was frequently struck by the beauty of the place. The Calderans valued inspiration and creation above all else, and it showed in everything they did. Elegant columns and intricate statuary adorned even modest homes. 
the street lights were cast and polished with the same care as a set of fine silverware and gleamed in the sun. She passed through the flowered trellis of her family's tastefully landscaped front garden just as the family was gathering around the breakfast table. As they did every morning, her mother and siblings took their breakfast on the family's sun porch, where they could enjoy the sights and aromas of their front garden in the warmth of the rising sun. Amanita quickly took a seat. Already at the table were her fraternal twin sister, Analita, and her younger brother, Joshua. Both were dressed in their pajamas, more accustomed to starting their day with the sunrise than finishing it, as Nita did. Late again, Miss Amanita. Trouble at the steamworks? asked Marissa, the cook. She was a matronly older woman with a frizz of silver hair, barely tamed by a white bonnet. In her hand, she held a basket of freshly baked rolls, which she added to a table already set with fine china and an assortment of fruits, pastries, and hot cereal. Nothing much. A chunk of scale from Boiler 3 broke free and jammed one of the secondary manifolds. The whole thing nearly blew its top, but a few of us managed to release the pressure. Just got a bit messy is all. Nita explained, as she buttered herself a roll. "'Nothing much,' said her mother, Gloria, with a cluck of her tongue. "'It sounds awfully dangerous to me.' The matriarch of the Grouse clan, Gloria Grouse, looked very much the part. Time had done little to fade her beauty over the years. What few lines and wrinkles had found their way into her features served only to underscore her elegance. She fixed her hair, striped with its first strands of silver, pulled back into a tight bun, and even at the breakfast table she wore a gown, petticoat, and satin gloves. There was a telling weariness to her, though, a bone-deep fatigue that was out of place so early in the morning. Don't worry so much, mother. It isn't anything we haven't been trained for. I just had to put the old monkey toe to use. You know, Miss Barkin from the Art Academy was just talking about opening their doors again. I could have your father talk to her about reserving a spot for you. Mother, we've been through this. I just feel that you deserve a chance to have a calling in life that is a bit more... Nita rolled her eyes and completed the sentence. Proper? Ladylike? Acceptable? I was going to say artistic. Amanita's mother had never truly approved of her daughter's decision to take a job at the steamworks. It was only right, in the eyes of most Calderans, to devote one's life to the creation of objects of beauty. No one held this view closer to their hearts than the Grouse clan. Over the generations, Nita's family had produced some of the finest sculptors, musicians, and painters in all of Caldera. That tradition continued to this day. Each of Nita's siblings had found a suitably creative calling. Annalita was a dancer and artist's model. Though she shared a birthday with Nita, the pair were anything but identical. Nita, quite lovely in her own right, seemed terribly plain beside Lita. Beside Lita, a goddess would be plain. Tall and slim, with dancer's legs, Lita had a flawless face and a rhythmic grace that showed in her every motion. Her eyes were ice blue, a match for her mother's, and she took the time each morning to paint her fingernails, 
color her lips, pull up her hair, and otherwise put an artist's touch to her delicate features. Nita wasn't quite as tall, wasn't quite as well-proportioned, and wasn't quite as graceful. Her eyes were her father's brown, her hair a deep brown rather than her sister's glorious black. In short, she wasn't quite Lita. In her youth, it had been a point of great envy, but such childish feelings had been left behind for the most part. Joshua was 18 years old, two years younger than his sisters. He was the spitting image of his father, a strong, stout build, deep brown eyes, short brown hair, and a head taller than Nita. Though just finished with his schooling, he had already made a name for himself as both a sculptor and a musician. A part of that, perhaps, was having Lita as a model and dancer for his compositions, but his original works earned no less renown. The two of them had become precisely what the rest of Talan had expected them to be, fine artists and worthy inheritors of the Grouse name. When Nita became a steam worker, many viewed it as an admission of defeat. Those who found a place in a more utilitarian role weren't precisely looked down upon in Calderon society, but they were universally viewed as those who had failed to find a way to contribute to the beauty of their land. In a way, this was true of Nita. As a child, she'd tried her very best to follow in the family tradition. Alas, she didn't have the legs for dance, nor the ear for music. Though her hands were steady enough, she didn't have the eye for painting or sculpture. It wasn't until she tried her hand at constructing the intricate clockwork music boxes that had brought her father his fortune that she found her true talent. She was a tinkerer, and something in the building of a mechanism ignited her passion. Perhaps she could have continued with the clockwork sculptures and music boxes and earned the position her countrymen viewed as her birthright. But what held her fascination wasn't the beauty of the machines, but the way they worked. It was thus only a matter of time before she found her way into the steamworks, the grandest mechanism in all of Caldera. You shouldn't have to toil away in that place. I like to toil away in that place, mother. I do important work there, and I do it well. Foreman Stover says the system-wide pressure losses have been down four notches since I was made a free wrench. Gloria gave her daughter a gentle smile of encouragement that betrayed a complete lack of understanding of anything Nita had said, save that it seemed to be a point of pride. Well, that's lovely, dear. Where is father this morning? Joshua asked, spooning out a serving of the steamy pot of oatmeal set on the table. Your father had to leave early, I'm afraid. He's to discuss matters with the council in Drummer's Valley again today. The council? About what? That's your father's business, dear. Something about the perimeter battery, I imagine. No doubt they want to request another contribution to be sure the guns are greased and ready. They certainly have been discussing the guns an awful lot lately, Lita said, selecting a peach from the fruit bowl. I hear the folks from the west have been making airships that can go even lighter. 
We've got to improve our guns, or they might be out of range now. It seems silly to me, Lita said. As far as I can remember, we've never even fired those guns except to test them. And at the annual memorial celebrations. Surely if the outsiders had wanted to invade, they would have done so by now. Better to dismantle the ugly things. Make room for a magnificent lighthouse or two. Or perhaps a really grand statue like they have at the mouth of Maristus Strait. That titan could really use a bride. Oh, I'm sure the outsiders would love that. You know what a mess the rest of the world is. Foul air. People floating about in those ugly machines. Keeping them out is the only thing that has kept us safe from the same fate, Joshua said. They are completely lawless out there. Nita filled her dish as her brother spouted the same tired speech she'd been hearing her entire life. Caldera had indeed closed its borders to the outside many decades ago, long before she or even her parents were born. These days, the only time people were likely to get a glimpse of a foreigner was during one of the few authorized trade visits, or else by sneaking off and trading with black marketers, as Drew did. Everything she knew about the outside was based on hearsay and rumor. It was said that their technology was far beyond that of Caldera, with swift airships that could cross the sea in days instead of weeks, and mechanisms that made the coil carriage look primitive by comparison. Of course, she'd also heard they were enslaved by a legion of ghoulish fiends and that their favorite food was boiled rat. Like most things, Nita took the tales of their exploits with a grain of salt. I hear they even throw their own airmen into the sea for the most minor offenses, and... Mother, is something wrong? Nita looked up to see her mother slowly lowering her teacup to the table. Her hand shook visibly, threatening to spill it. It is nothing, dear. Put it out of your mind, she said, rubbing her fingers with her other hand. It's getting worse, isn't it? Nita said. It's nothing. I... Just didn't get very much sleep, dear. I'm tired. Have the treatments been helping? Nita asked. Yes, yes, dear, of course. It will pass, she said, holding out her hand as the tremor began to subside. There, you see? Nothing to worry about. In her day, Gloria Grouse had been the finest sculptor in Caldera, if not the world. Shortly after her children were born, however, she noticed an unsteadiness in her hands. To her and the family's horror, she was found to be suffering Gantz disease. It was rare. No more than three cases had been recorded in the history of Caldera, but the prognosis was well known. Shakiness was just the first symptom, but it had already robbed her of the precision necessary to honor her muse. For a lifelong artist, that was almost worse than the disease's ultimate result, early death. The family tried not to discuss it, as what little could be done had been done. Yet, if the tremors were back, it meant the end could be very near. Now, let us not have sour faces around my table, hmm? said Marissa as she cleared away the empty dishes. Josh and Lita have a full day ahead of them, and Nita has a long day behind her. 
Yes, off with you, children. The Academy wants me to select a lecturer to fill in for me. The family stood to go about their day, but Nita lingered. Her mother had moved unsteadily to the parlor and stood staring at something on the mantel. It was littered with vases, statues, sketches, and paintings, as well as a large handmade clock of Nita's father's design. Gloria could have been staring at any one of them, but Nita knew, without asking, which it was that held her mother's gaze. Mother? Oh, yes, I'm Anita, dear, she answered, shaken from her reverie. How long has it been? Nita asked, plucking a small figurine of a deer from the mantle. It was skillfully made from clay, but, unlike the other figurines, it was unglazed and unpainted. Oh, sixteen years now. Oh, cruel fate, eh? To take my gift from me before I could paint my final piece. She paused to settle down to a chair. These days she couldn't spend more than a few minutes on her feet. Tell me, dear, what you do at the steamworks, does it make you happy? Does it feed your spirit and nourish your heart? It is very fulfilling. Then cherish it, love. You won't have it forever, and you never know when you might lose it. I think back sometimes to balls I attended, galas I hosted. I think of all the hours I could have spent with my fingers in the clay or with a chisel in my hand. There isn't anything I wouldn't give to have just one of those hours back again. Just one more day that I could hold a brush and know that the line I paint would stay straight and true. A tear ran down her cheek. Oh, but listen to me. No sense talking like that. We look to the future in this family. I can still teach, eh? Off with you. Get some rest. Don't listen to your silly old mother. Nita lingered for a moment more, looking thoughtfully at the unfinished figurine, then placed it on the mantel and left her mother to rest. This concludes another episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Thanks for joining me, your host, Benjamin Douglas, for another indie author reading. If you liked what you heard, be sure to visit http colon slash slash thebookspeakspodcast.wordpress.com for more episodes and for links to the author's website, and the author's Amazon author page in the show notes. If you'd like to follow me on my own author journey, you can find me at http colon slash slash benjamindouglasbooks.wordpress.com. And of course, if you're an indie author interested in having your work featured on the show, or if you're interested in discussing having your book read and produced by me as an audiobook, feel free to contact me at benjamindouglasbooks at gmail.com. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you have a productive and enjoyable weekend.